Welcome. This is the Punk CX Podcast. My name is Adrian Swinsco, and I'm an advisor, best-selling author, Forbes contributor, and general explorer of the service and experience space. On the podcast, I seek out and interview entrepreneurs, leading business people, authors, tech leaders, academics, and generally cool people doing interesting stuff in the service and experience space. Check out the archive at adrianswinsco.com. That's enough from me. Let's get into the interview. So welcome to the next edition of the Punk CX Podcast. With me today, I have James Lowther, Scottish pronunciation, who um, I was getting it wrong. I was saying Lowther, but he just corrected me, said Lowther, because actually that's the, the way it should be pronounced. Anyway, I ramble on. James is a longtime friend through the blogosphere. Now, if you don't know what the blogosphere is, look it up, ladies and gentlemen. Look it up. It's, it's pretty simple. Um, but he's also not just a longtime friend, through the blogs for you, but he's also a friend now because we've known each other for a number of years. I hate to count it's probably more than 10 uh, oh, now. Yeah. Yeah, it's more than 10. 15. He's also a newly minted author. More on that in a bit, in a minute. Uh, a corporate escapee and now uh, an advisor to any organization that sort of needs his help. But just want to say, James, we've known each other for, for a long time. I love the, the the work and the way that you talk about things, but you know you've written a book. And so I was excited to invite you on the podcast to talk about your book, but like, welcome. And rather than me relying on my overview, can you give us a bit of a thumbnail sketch on you and the work that you do? Well, absolutely, I can. So first of all, thank you very much for having me. I really enjoy your podcast. I am not at all sure about your intro music. That, that took me just a couple <laughs> of years before my time, I'm afraid. Um, so... Uh, yeah, I am for my C. So I am 55 years old, just returned, and um, I spent 33 years in corporate Britain. I have done all sorts of operational roles. So I have pat frozen peas. I have. I was very big in chicken curry at one stage. I stacked supermarket shelves with chicken curry, and I paid marine insurance claims. I bombarded people with junk mail, and I've also collected overdue taxes. And during that time, I rose to the dizzy heights of middle management. Um, and a couple of years ago, I was made redundant again. They call it an ICE now. Did you hear that? ICE? Involuntary corporate, sorry, involuntary, uh, I'll get it in a second, involuntary career events. So I was iced again. Wow. And, then, and I just thought, well, I've been on the corporate bus for long enough now. Thank you very much. I am going to try something else. As you say, I'm an advisor. I am with friends. I consult on productivity and operational strategy. And as you can see from my, uh, in my CV, I've either got a wealth of experience or I'm incapable of holding down a job. I suppose you have to listen to the rest of this interview to decide which one it is. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, so now we've known each other for a long time and I actually looked it up. And I think the first time we were in touch was back in 2011, although I think it might be earlier than that. Um, yes, but it's uh, but I've always loved your kind of point of view and your writing. So I was really excited to learn, and um, and I guess I am responsible for a little bit of prodding along the way. But I was excited to learn that you you actually have actually got down and written a book, sort of pulled all this sort of stuff that you that you've been thinking about and talking about for years together. And but this book is is called "Managed by Morons: The Path to a Thriving Organization," and I just love the title. I love a bit of a, a bit of a, something what my people call profanity me, uh, but it makes people sit up and pay attention. So what what, what I wanted to ask you to do is that can tell me a little bit about it. You know, like who's it for and what's its main thesis? Uh, so it's a book and it is aimed at I suppose middle managers and senior managers of large organisations. And really, it's just a distillation of what I learned over those 33 years. They say you should write about what you know, and I only know about one thing, and that's big corporations, so I decided to write that. And I suppose the primary thesis of it is that management is really easy. You know, it's been well studied and it's been understood for ages, but most managers don't do it. And if I was to use an analogy, it's a little bit like losing weight. So people know is yeah, losing weight, very straightforward. You know, lay off the chips and get in the gym. But you know, less calories in, more calories out. It is as simple as that. <laughs> but yeah, but it takes it's hard work and there are no quick fixes. And you can watch the TV commercials and look at abdominizers until you're blue in the face, but it won't help you lose weight. Yeah. And people don't do it. And I think management is really similar. So uh when you start to read about it. 
you just see the same things coming up over and over and over again. And there's one particular model I like. It's by a guy called uh, Mark Jenkins. Mm-hmm. And he's a professor of business strategy at Cranfield. And I bought one of his books, which was he looked, he investigated Formula One. And he said he came up with this thing called the performance pyramid. He said, if you really want to, your uh, if you really want your organization to succeed, only three things you need to worry about. So the first thing is focus. So are you really clear what your organization is there to do and what you're doing for customers? Mm-hmm. The second thing is learn and improve. So improvement only comes from learning. Learning, are you improving your processes? Are you improving your systems? Are you constantly getting better? And the final thing is, do you have a culture which underlines all of that? Right. And I read his book. Well, it's a very good little um, YouTube video. I'm sorry, I remember I'll send you the link for the video where he talks it through. But I read this and I thought, well, Oh, he resonated with me. And what works for Formula One, I can tell you, works in insurance companies, banks, retail companies, manufacturers, chemical works, and data services companies, right? Mm. But it was just really, it was a rehash of the stuff that Edward Deming was talking about in the 1950s. Yeah. Nothing new here at all. It's just, it's the same stuff over and over again. And then, so I kind of get to the point where I just think um, that, it's easy, but I, so if it's so easy, you come to the conclusion that managers, they're either, well, they're either not educated. Well, that's a little worry since big corporations aren't educated to managers. They're stupid or lazy. Well, you can say what you like about most managers, but they don't tend to be. Or worse still, I think they're just more worried about their own position and how they come over and their own egos than the performance of their organizations. Mm. So there you go. I suppose that's it. Management, really easy, a bit like losing weights, but most managers don't do it. And hence the name of the book, Managed by Morons. And yeah, okay. So was it an attention grabbing title? Yes, it was. What's really interesting is the feedback I've got. And everybody says to me, Oh, you've met my boss then. Yeah. It's just <laughs> so um, there you go. That's the thesis. Well, I think the thing is it strikes me that there's there's two things that strikes me. And there's this old sort of like saying, which says people join a company and then leave a boss. Oh, very true. Yeah. Um, and so that sort of speaks to that. But there's also this other piece of data that comes out of a big piece of um, uh, research that Gallup did, which yeah. I think you might feature in the book as well. And it's about this idea that they said there's top quartile performing organizations and bottom quartile performing organizations. And they said they their research found that 76% of the variance in performance yeah. can be explained by the quality of their management. Yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and I think that's a really interesting kind of one. But then you when you kind of add into that the idea that most training budgets for our big corporates, most of it goes to either is on the high performers or in yeah. people at the top end of the organization. Yeah. And then the other kind of major part goes to the front line. Yeah. Almost like dealing with day-to-day sort of like stuff, trying to do improve efficiency and productivity and stuff. And yet the middle layer, if you like the meat in the sandwich or the filler in the sandwich, generally gets ignored. Yes. And so you end up with this potentially – dysfunctional kind of layer that, or not necessarily dysfunctional layer, but it, it turns out to be dysfunctional because it's largely not invested in and ignored and not respected and all these sort of different sort of things. And so it's, I think it's, it's a really interesting sort of like bit. And it's something I've written about before where that actually said the middle actually matters because it's, this is where the work in well, inverted commas gets it's, done. It's, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Cause you've got the people at the, uh, Cold face doing the do, working the work. You've got the people at the top who are worried about money, but it's the people in the middle who are translating the money to work, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, which is really very important. I think. Absolutely. Um, so I really like the kind of the you know the idea and the premise of it, and actually having something which focuses on the uh, that kind of middle kind of management, that sort of that that layer, with, and trying to sort of diagnose and 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 help people understand about how to make. Things, if you, as you say, simple, you know. Um, but I wanted to give people a flavor of the book. Um, obviously, we want people to go and buy the book. Um, but I wanted to give people a flavor of the book to help with that. 
And so I thought we'd like to dig into some of the things that stood out for me in the book. And one of the first things was, you said, and we may have already answered this question, but let me kind of ask it anyway. So earlier in the book, you say that many organizations are mediocre. And like, why is that? Do you think? Well, yeah, I think there's two bits to that. Why do I say it? And why do I believe it to be the case? Right. There you go. Why do I say, it? well, as an employee, as I said, you know, I work for a lot of organizations. I work for <laughs> six large corporations. And they're, we're all, these were all sort of FTSE 100 territory. Yeah. yeah. Big, successful businesses. Of those six, and I'm not going to be out name names because I will get sued, but one I was saying was truly excellent. One was really very good. Three were distinctly average. One was dreadful. And you average that out. So <laughs> my sample of six, my personal truth, Yes, large organisations are mediocre on average. But as a customer as well, Mm -hmm. what's my experience as an organisation? So if you go into any big box store out of town, yeah, the employees all stand there looking at you on a Sunday night, Sunday morning, a bit like they'd want to rather have their eyeballs scooped out with a teaspoon than be then. (laughs) How is that good management? Or my personal peeve, you phone up a call centre and bank or a telephony company or whoever it might be and they say to you your your call is important to us well if it was that flipping water why don't you answer the damn thing then that's another <laughs> thought and then it's not just corporations and big organizations so the nhs i think the nhs my personal experience is when there is something seriously wrong with you they are brilliant mm-hmm but the rest of the time, it's just like one big waiting room. Isn't it? You just sit there for hours and hours and hours. And people say, oh, it's because we haven't got the money and we haven't got resources. And I just push back. No organization's got the resources. It's just because they're badly managed. So there you go. That's the basis of my opinion. What's my experience? In terms of why do I think, what's the reasons for that? I think it comes back to those three things I was talking about earlier. So number one, what are the organisations focused on? I heard a lovely bit of business jargon the other day. I've not heard it before. To jump the shark. Have you ever heard of jumping the shark? Uh, no. So jumping the shark, you'll use this now, I'll tell you this. <laughs> jumping the shark is um, apparently it comes from happy days. You remember happy days. You're of that age, I'm sure. The yeah. Fond. Yeah, right. So there was an episode of happy days where Henry Winkler, who was the guy who played the fonds, apparently he was quite a good water skier. So what they decided was they'd have an episode where he was on water skis and he jumped the shark, jumped a shark. And then the whole point being, this had got absolutely nothing to do with the series or what the um, people who were watching the viewers wanted. It was just they did it because they could. Mm-hmm. And I think most organisations get to that, right? They don't worry about what their customers want. They just focus on what the managers want and what the managers want is more money. Mm-hmm. They miss the point by focusing on money rather than focusing on customers. Mm. And the point there is that they're managing the output of their organisation and not the inputs. And I was listening to a blog, uh, sorry, a podcast the other day, and this guy came out and he said, "Um, if you manage your employees, sorry, if you treat your, look after your employees, they will look after your customers. And if you look after the customers, they'll look after your revenue. So the point there being, you know, look after your employees and customers and the revenue will look after itself. So yeah. most management is operation stable door. You know, the horse is bolted, but yeah. they do the wrong thing. And so focus, you know, I think the purpose of an organization is to look after its customers because then the revenues will arise. It's not to worry about EBIT or top line or heaven forbid, it gets still still down to things like average channel time or whatever it might be. And you just drive a whole load of the wrong behaviors because you're focusing on the wrong. So that's the first thing. Now, why do I think that is? Focus is wrong. Mm-hmm. The second part, I think, is all about this idea of learning and improvement and improving your systems and learning what's going on. So I think we get confused. Most businesses are not like window cleaners, right? If you're a window cleaner, you can stay there and you can stay, you understand your business implicitly. Probably got a notebook and a hose pipe when you're away. Yeah, maybe a bad. But banks don't work like that, and insurance companies don't work like that, and big retail operations don't work like that. They're much, much more complicated. And the only people who really understand how organisations work 
to the people at the bottom of the organization because they do the work. Yeah. It's the guy who has to run the macro every Friday, otherwise the accounting system falls over. Yeah. It's or the guy who has to look at how the batch interface is working. It's the devil is in the detail. Mm-hmm. So if you want to make your organization better, you really need to understand how your organization works, which means you have to engage the people who are caught working in your organization. And Tim Harford, um, he does a great TED talk and he talks about the God complex. And the God complex being that managers think they know everything and they're all powerful and they've been promoted and they're senior. And so they don't ask, they go away and implement what they think is right. And I think that's why most sort of organization improvement efforts or transformation projects fail is because they don't go and look at what the problems are. They push out what's big or sexy, whatever the management equivalent of the abdominizer happens to be at the moment, Mm. rather than really looking and seeing what's going on. So a counterpoint to that, I think, is probably or the story of Dave Brailsford and the UK cycling team. So you've heard about watching games, yeah? So the British cycling team, I don't think in 110 years they had ever won the Tour de France, and they hadn't won anything from the Olympic Games since 1908. What Dave Brailsford did, amongst other things, but one of his things was just to look at the system that they were working with and implement what he called marginal games. Mm-hmm. So he made sure that all the all the uh, cyclists knew how to wash their hands so that they didn't get colds. He brought with it the best pillows and mattresses for his team so that he could sleep most comfortably. But he kept on looking at the system and improving parts of the system. And that's one of the key strategies for that. And I think we went on, did we not, to win the um, Tour de France in 2012, 2013, 2015, 2016, 2017, which just shows how successful you can be if you really look and understand small stuff. Mm-hmm. But for most managers, that's just not sexy, is it? Right? You're not going to get promoted on teaching people how to wash their hands. Sure. And so I think, you know, the whole point about learning and improvement is it comes from testing and learning. And most managers are too busy with high status projects that they just can't afford to have fail. So again, not really looking to improve their system. And then the final bit, because I'm on a roll, this whole idea of culture. But if you think, well, improving your business and what it does for your customers, it's all about the system. It's all about knowing what your customer wants. And it's all about learning failure, because you don't learn unless you fail at something. But most managers are really interested in short-term targets, people management, blaming people and punishments. And if you're working in an organization, why on earth would you try something new if your boss is going to jump up and down on your head if you get something wrong, mm-hmm. get you out. Or alternatively, if you're um, in an organisation, it's all about ranking and stacking and how you rate relative to your peers, why would you share what you know happens to work? Because that's sure. what, right. And so we may talk about dysfunctional cultures and actions not matching the aims of the organisation. It's alive and well across corporate Britain, I think. And those are the key reasons why I think when you did ask, but why I think most organisations are mediocre. I know. I think. I think there's. Um, that's that's absolutely can look fair. And <laughs> excuse me. I think the. Um, I experienced this recently, where I was involved in a project for a short while, and it was with a big institution. Yeah. Um, and they're all you know, talking about their values and this and how they want to wait, the way they want to work and all these different sort of things. And then you can see, then you, I was privy to seeing how they responded to something almost yeah. in real time. It was an internal event and it's like, there was something going on and there was a few hiccups and then you can see how the most senior person in the room responded to that. Yeah. And there was no, they would say, yeah, we learned from our, learned from our mistakes and things, but there was no trusting their team to deliver, allowing a bit of flexibility, they, you know, and, um, and all that type of stuff. It's almost a bit like they defaulted that it was like, ah, oh, this is going to look bad on me. And they defaulted to getting kind of like freaked out and then went into control freakery mode and then started to micromanage things in real time which was of no help to anybody because people were just more focused on what that person was thinking yeah, rather than kind of what they were supposed to, supposed to be doing. 
Yeah. So success looks like pleasing your boss rather than pleasing your customer. Right. And so that was, it was a fascinating thing. So there's this, this, this massive gap between rhetoric and action. Yeah. And I think that's the only thing that you kind of, you, the only way that you really understand how your organization kind of behaves is when you put it under stress. Yes. Um, but I, I'm sure we can go down that's kind of like rabbit hole about it and kind of regale each other with other kind of like stories. But I, there's a lot of other things in the, in the book that, that I like, particularly the quotes, because I'm a lover and collector of, of quotes. And, and many of them have resonated with me. There was one in particular, and it's like a favourite of mine, and I know it's a favourite of yours as well, comes from Charles Goodhart. Ah, yeah, yeah. And it bears repeating and exploring. So can you tell me about it and what we should be thinking about when it comes to our own measurement of performance? Because measurement becomes the bane of all this sort of stuff in many ways. So this is, so for my sins, one of the things I have got is a, you know, an MBA. I studied for an MBA, and this is one of the most important things they did not teach me at a business school I went to, right? <laughs> so... And I'm on dangerous ground here because I know you're an economist, Adrian, right? So Charles Goodhart was an economist. And if I get this wrong, you'll have to um, dig me out. But he was an economist and he worked for the Bank of England during the 70s and 80s. And he was really quite critical of Margaret, Margaret Thatcher's government. So he wrote, and I've written this down because it's a bit of a mouthful. Whenever a government seeks to rely on a previously observed statistical regularity for control purposes that regularity will collapse. And you think, oh my word, what does that mean? So I want to simplify it a little bit. It's been simplified to what's known as Goodhart's Law, which is- but It's also a bit like, I need to get there. It's a bit like the Hawthorne effect in on. psychology. Yeah. I, I think you're about to say, which is where the behavior of the observed changes under observation. Oh, uh, absolutely. Right. So- the simple version of this is when the measure becomes a target, it ceases to become a good measure. Mm -hmm. The really simple word version of it is if you give people a target, they will cheat, right? <laughs> it's very straightforward. Now, if you want to be really sure they're going to cheat, what you should do is you should add a whopping great big carrot, maybe a great big baroness, or apply a stick, um, a P45. Sorry, I don't know if you've got the American listeners. If you have P45 is the um, document you get given by the tax office if you've been made redundant. As we've established, I've got several of those to me now. But, <laughs> right, yeah, if you want people to cheat, give them a target and um, add an incentive. And people say to me, oh, James, you know, you're being really cynical. Yeah, it, it doesn't happen like that. People are better than that. Right. Believe me, they are not. I have seen it. Well, let me give you an example. This is a real example that I've seen people sort of talk about, but it's been around uh, for a number of kind of years, particularly in that sort of mobile telephony space. Yeah, yeah. Like mobile wireless, cell phones, all that type of stuff. It's just, I think it's the same thing where people are going to go in and um, you go and say, your your contract's up for renewal and you're going and you want to renew your contract or you want to get a new phone or whatever. And you speak to one of the people in the shop if you haven't done it online. So you go into the shop, and you've done all your things, and everything's going to be great. And then the person that has been helping you turns around and says, you'll get, following this, you'll get a survey. Yeah. It'd be really great if you give me a nine or a 10. Yeah. Because my bonus yeah. is dependent on it. Yeah. And you look at it and you just go to your point. It's like, it's not a fair and honest sort of like thing. It's like you give them a target and you link an incentive to it or a reward to it. And then people will try and manage the system to their benefit. Right, absolutely. And their performance has got actually pretty much nothing to do with them as an individual. It's all about the system that they are working with. Mm -hmm. So just to build on that thought, right, there's a guy called uh, Christopher Hood, and he was a professor at Oxford University, and what he did was he studied the NHS, the National Health Service, mm -hmm. and uh, successive governments have managed the National Health Service by giving them lots of targets to hit. And these were classic P45 targets, and then it's, you're going to get shot. So mm -hmm. let me give you an example of a couple he came up with. GPs were targeted on making sure they saw everybody within 48 hours. Yeah. So what a number of GP surgeries did was they just stopped taking bookings more than 48 hours ahead. So if the booking is not there, they can't be late, <laughs> can't they? That's very straightforward. It's brilliant. Right? 
Or um, my personal favourite was um, in hospitals. So within hospitals, uh, the target was that an emergency admission, anybody came in, had to be given a bed within 12 hours of being admitted. And of course, the capacity in hospitals beds from limiting factors. This is quite tough. So what a number of very enterprising hospital managers realised was that actually what they could do is when the, the guy would come off the um, ambulance and he'd be on the stretch of the wheels on it and they'd roll in this stretcher and then it'd get to 11 and a half hours. And what they'd do is they'd send out a staff nurse with a spanner and she'd take the wheels off the flipping stretcher. And because the wheels, the stretcher didn't have any wheels, it's now a bed and therefore they've hit their target. <laughs> And you've got to think to yourself, I mean, you, could that person not have been employed doing something more useful than taking wheels off stretches? Because they're obviously smart. Right. And some other fool's got to put the wheels back on later before it goes back in the ambulance, presumably. And so you imagine, right, now I, I choose the NHS to talk about just because there was a study, but that's somewhere where people go and work because it's a vocation. Mm -hmm. Now, you imagine somewhere nice and commercial, or I don't know, like an IT sales force or something like that. You give them a target, you can imagine exactly what's going to happen there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But the thing is, this isn't new news. There's a lovely story about Hanoi, turn of the 20th century, 1902, like you've heard of the Great Hanoi Rat Massacre. No. So what happened was, Hanoi was, at the time, it was a French colony, and they had a real problem with rats. The whole place was infested with rats. And um, so the no self-respecting French bureaucrat likes rats. So what they did was they um, issued a bounty. You know, you come to us with a dead rat, we'll make you a payment. And I don't know what it was, you know, one franc for every 10 dead rats or whatever it was. But obviously, the last thing the French uh, government buildings wanted was piles and piles of dead rats. So they said, well, you'd have to bring us the whole rats, just bring us the rat's tail. And so, okay, so they were inundated in rat's tails and they made lots of payments. But the population of rats didn't seem to be going down at all in any way, shape, or form. And um, eventually somebody noticed that there were just lots of rats running around without any tails on. And, you know, it's a very foolish bounty hunter who kills the rat, because if he kills the rat, it can't breathe, can it? And you're just cutting off a revenue stream. So it is the law of unintended consequences. But what's really is you give people a target, they will cheat. But, you know, you're managed by morons. Is standard management practice. Mm. This is what I want you to do. You go on courses, smart goal courses. I mean, they talk about pain and snake oil. So you've got a smart goal. You've got um, an incentive. What will happen? People will cheat. What has cheating got to do with building a thriving organisation, something where customers and employees love it? Nothing. So there you go. That's my brand over on targets. <laughs> so I think, you know, if, and there's one thing, one thing you really ought to be thinking about is when you come to measure people, measurement's fine, but don't give people a reason to cheat. Yeah? Yeah. Back off the incentives. Choose high-level metrics. Make sure that it's things that teams of people are working on rather than individuals, and you just reduce the amount of cheating you'll get on. Yeah, perfect. Um, so the other thing I wanted to move on to was that um, there's a, uh, a great story about... Soap factor, soap factory in Liverpool yeah. run by kind of like uh, Unilever and the block yeah. nozzle. And I thought that was definitely worth you know, recounting. So can you tell me about soap in Liverpool? Yeah, I can. So this comes back to the whole point about testing and understanding and learning and improving your processes and your systems. So the story goes, and I, and I have had this verified because I actually started my career working for Unilever, and I would just like to point out they were definitely in the top half of the organisations that I worked for. But um, in the 1980s, they had a problem, and that problem was they make soap powder, and the way you make soap powder is you mix together a slurry of ingredients, and you pump it through a nozzle into a vacuum chamber, and then all the water evaporates off, and you get soap powder you know, floats down to the bottom of the chamber and you scrape that out and you bang it in boxes and you sell it. And then what happened was the nozzle kept blocking. It just got a nasty mess. I don't know, have you ever worked in a factory, Adrian, or not? Uh, yeah. Um, the um, similar one, I worked in a Coca-Cola bottling kind of mm. factory at one point. And so it's... Uh, Gunky well, nozzles you, and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, is. well, you will know, though, that when something stops... People run around like their hair is on fire. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's very expensive, very quickly. 
and people think they needed to fix this. So they set about it and they put two teams on fixing. And the first team, the first team were, it was the obvious choice, the smart people, the ones you wanted in the room. So they've got chemists and engineers and people who knew about or fluid dynamic and heat exchange and that type of stuff. And they went away and they looked at the problem and they looked at the nozzle and they did some measurements. And um, they got out probably slide rules. This was the 1980s before your spreadsheets, but they redesigned the nozzle and they put a new nozzle into production. And it was a better nozzle. Yeah, they had solved some of the problems, but it wasn't perfect. So then they got the next team. And the next team were a bunch of evolutionary biologists. Now, I'm going to take the mic. I'm safe to do this because I have got a degree in genetics. But evolutionary biologists do not know about production engineering. The only thing they know about is sex and only then in theory, not practice, right? These are not the obvious guys to come get fix in your factory. But what they did was they looked at this nozzle. They took the best one and they made 10 copies of it. And then they ever so slightly modified each one of those 10 copies. They made it a bit longer, a bit shorter, put a gouge in here, a divot in there, whatever it might be. And then they ran those 10 copies and they picked the best, not the best nozzle out for touching the one which ran for the longest and gave mm-hmm. the best lots of products. So they took that best one and then they made 10 copies of that, divot, gouge, bit smaller, bit bigger, and they ran those through production. And then they took the next one and they made 10 copies. Oh, I could go on and on, right? But they went through this process for 45 generations. They effectively wow. apply, applied the sort of natural selection approach to mm-hmm. how this nozzle operated. And eventually they ended up with this fantastic nozzle, nozzle that went on and on forever and produced beautiful quality soap powder. And, you know, a bit growing success. Nobody really understood how it worked. Interesting points. But the real point here was, you know, they went through 45 generations. They had 449 failures and one success. Mm-hmm. And can you imagine explaining that to your boss when something's going wrong? No, 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 no it's okay, Gov. I won failure 323. Bear with me. It's not the way we work. Yeah. But the whole point being, if you really want to understand or make something work better, you've got to try different things, test it, see what works, not jump to conclusions. So there you go. There's the soap factory story about it. Good story. Brilliant. I mean, and I, I think it's it's just a, it, it's kind of an extreme illustration about kind of like that sort of test and learn kind of like kind of process. But, you know, I spoke to other people on the podcast and they've talked about this idea that experimentation is one of these habits that okay. organizations with the best, you know, the best cultures is that they um that they have it's just built into kind of what they do and how they do things um and being able to sort of to challenge or stop a an experiment is the whole population of the organization is 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 enabled to do that if they think it's not going to work or it's going to run in conflict of things so they've got like a really good sort of like culture that promotes that sort of yeah, thing yeah that allows it yeah, I just I thought I would kind of like uh, flip it around and actually say, well, if we were to think about our own organizations or to think about the, the people that are listening to the podcast and think about their, uh, ask them to think about their organizations, I mean, what would, what are the signs of a poor culture? And, um, and is fixing that just the kind of like thinking about how do we flip it around? Or do we just go back to what you were talking about before about the focus and the, and all those, those, those two things keep it, keep it simple. But I guess the first question is going to be, what would be the signs to look out for having a poor culture? Well, the signs, that's, um, there's that lovely quote, uh, Peter Drucker, you like quotes, some I do too, but culture eats strategy for breakfast. So what mm. does he mean by that? You know, culture will just, if you've got a good culture, it will knock any strategy into a cocked hat. Um, and people say, the other thing about culture is they say, well, how do you define culture? It's the way we do things around here. It's the behaviours, the things you see. Um, but I do think that's just the tip of the iceberg. It's what you see. It's not really what's going on in people's minds. So I dropped out a post on to get on LinkedIn recently. And just, you know, these are, this is a dysfunctional culture. These are the things that I see. What do you think? And the things I came up with, well, uh, perception trumps performance. Conformity is revealed into senses are ostracized. Managers know all the answers, so staff don't speak up. Good news <laughs> that happens and problems are hidden. 
Um, success is claimed by leaders where failure is blamed on staff. So that's what I came up with. I got some responses. And the two that I really liked were leaders amplify stress rather than act as shock absorbers. Well, that's interesting. What is the role of a boss? What are you there for? Mm-hmm. And the one which I just thought was priceless was there are named car parking spaces. And I- <laughs> I went for a job interview once, a big Swiss company who's uh, it shall remain nameless. And, um, and and it wasn't just in case anybody guesses Nestle. I don't need Nestle lawyers at me. It wasn't Nestle. Um, but I turned up for this interview and um, there were a series of Mercedes Benz parts by the front door and they got from really big to just average size Mercedes and just got further further away from the front door. And you just ask yourself, well, what does that say about the organisation? What's important there? Mm. So those, I think, are the symptoms, but the symptoms and the causes are not necessarily the same thing. Yeah, so how, what would a good culture look like? So I come back to that performance pyramid thing, the Mark Jenkins thing I was talking about earlier on. And he singled out four things. I'm not sure this is an exhaustive list. It's a good place to start. He said, in a good culture, people look at the long term, uh, they work as one team. There's constant communication between people. And the one which really resonated for me is no blame. People talk a lot about you know, psychological safety in organizations. But what does that really mean? What's a good example of that? So there is a story, an absolute story, about a, an airline crash. So in 1974, TWA flight 514 was going into Washington Dulles. It had flown out the Midwest somewhere. And um, it flew into the side of a mountain, Mount Werther, near Dulles Airport. And 92 people died. Every single person died. And uh, obviously, that is not good. You talk about customer issues, but having people dying in the workplace is about as bad as it gets. So you then say, well, how do you stop? serious accidents at work. Um, and there are a couple of the- uh, frameworks here which are worth talking about because I think they apply equally to customer service. But there's a thing called the accident triangle. So in the 1930s, the bloke came up with the accident triangle. And what that says is that for every death you have in the workplace, you have a handful of lost time accidents. And for every lost time accident you have, you have a handful of um, you know, serious injuries. And for every serious injury, you have a handful of minor injuries. And for every minor injury, you have a handful of near misses. Mm-hmm. And the point there being, it's really difficult to stop deaths in the workplace because they happen so infrequently, right? But when you start looking at near misses, there are thousands of them. And you can start to see patterns. And you can start to do things about it. And there's a similar theory which goes along, which is called the Swiss cheese theory. And so if you think if you buy a packet of Swiss cheese, the one with the holes in, the slices are in the supermarket, most of the time you can't see through the packet. But every now and again, all the holes will line up and you'll get a daylight flooding through. And that applies just as well to accidents. So if you think of a situation where, I don't know, a small child is playing football by a busy road and there are a lot of illegally parked cars and somebody's speeding, you can see quite easily how that would go horribly wrong. But mm-hmm. if you force the speed limit and you make sure people park legally and provide some somewhere sensible for children to play, then it won't happen. So there's the, the theory. Get on top of the near misses. Get on top of the near misses. Um, bad things won't happen. Now, the guys who uh, were responsible for policing the skies in the US, the FAA, Federal Aviation yeah, Department? I think so, yeah. It, it, yeah. They knew about this. This was not new news, and they had mandated it. It was law that if you had a near miss, you had to report it. But when they went and investigated this particular incident, they discovered it was just, it was just a misunderstanding between the um, control tower and the pilots. The control tower had said uh, cleared for landing, by which they meant uh, the runway is clear. The pilot took that as it's a clear route to landing, which it clearly wasn't because there was a mountain in the way. Mm. Exactly the same issue had happened with a uh, a plane two or three weeks earlier, the investigators discovered. 
But fortunately, that plane was flying 100 feet higher up and it just brushed the top of the trees. It didn't hit the mountain. But the pilots hadn't reported it, even though it was the law. And the reason why they hadn't reported it was they'd have had to report it to the FAA and the FAA uh, had the power to take their licenses off them. And mm-hmm. actually, you know, you've got your living, your livelihood resting on this. Why would you take the risk? Now, fortunately, happy story, um, NASA, bizarrely, came to the rescue. And what NASA did was they instigated a system whereby now what happens is the pilots report the near misses to NASA, but it's completely confidential. Right. And you have to do it. What NASA do is they compile all the information and then they send a report to the FAA. And off the back of that, the FAA go and act on the causes of the accident. So an example would be apparently in Texas, there was a solar farm and uh, the panels were blind and situated. It was blinding pilots. So the FAA went and talked to the operators and they changed the alignments of the panels. And well, you will know, actually, when we were kids, you've got frequent news reports of crashing planes, but now it happens very, very rarely. It's right. just massively successful. And um, there's just a little bit of a additional incentive there. If a pilot's uh, report or is invest- it's under investigation by the FAA and they show that they um, actually reported the near miss to NASA, then the FAA team has a positive mark for them and it shows they've got a um, constructive attitude towards safety. But the point being, if you can take blame out of the situation, blame and punishment, it will have a massive impact on your culture and also just it will help improve performance. So I think that's a, one of the things that's really important. Excellent. I mean, I think there's, I really like the book because it's full of like stories and, you know, uh, uh, and cases that you've applied to, you know, um, to talk about organizational failure and mishaps and kind of how all these things kind of manifest itself and how we get to that kind of point where you get, as you say, mediocre organizations, you know, um, and, but it, a lot of it's kind of aimed at sort of those middle kind of managers or just managers in general. Well, but yeah. I think actually it's more so that the, some of the middle managers aren't kind of helped, but the point is they can help themselves. Oh, absolutely. So I, what I would say to you, like ask you rather, what would be your best advice for, for to somebody for, to not be one of those managers or leaders to not be that moron? What would you say to them? Yeah. I think you need to stand back and say, when I die, who's coming to my funeral, right? Now, if you are the sort of guy who always hits his targets yeah, and always keeps his, his staff on his t- on their toes and is fantastic at managing his reputation upwards, how many of your staff are going to come to your funeral? How many of your customers are going to come to your funeral? Not many. Whereas if you can, if they say, you know, he was a great boss, he really listened to what we had to say, you know, he really cared about what we were doing, and it was a sad day when he left, then people will come to your funeral. So I would just think about that. Um, success is not about the size of the Rolex you buy with your bonus. You know, I worked for a guy once, and um, he took great pleasure in showing everybody his £40,000 watch. I kid you not. Right, for £40,000, I would want a watch that gave me an extra couple of hours in the day. Right? But he was <laughs> saying he couldn't justify spending the £60,000. Was that the best thing you could spend that money on? But here's the thing. What did that say about him? It talks in spades. You know, that was what was important to him was his ego and how he showed up, how good he was. But that's not the same thing as having a good organisation. It really isn't. So I suppose my piece of advice is bury your ego. Think about what people are going to say at your funeral. It reminds me of a saying that I, I, I think included in one of the punk books. Yeah. Pretty sure I hope I did. And it comes from Russell Howard, um, the comedian, who got some advice from his grandfather, uh, life advice from his grandfather, which I think is appropriate here. And his grandfather apparently said to him, he says, do your best, but don't be a dick. <laughs> very sensible. Yeah. <laughs> You're like, going, yeah, it's pretty straightforward. Well, yes, very straightforward. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so just want to wrap up. Is there anything else that we, you'd like to add or highlight that we've missed out before I get into some sort of quick fire wrap up questions? Well, there is. There's one thing I think. 
And it's this, just this point, and I've sort of touched on it, but performance is about the system. It is not about the people in the system. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You are not a window cleaner. You are managing a really big system. So I'm going to tell you one more story. Okay. So this really is a horror story. Um, so I live in Nottingham, as you know, and uh, our local big teaching hospital is called the Queen's Medical Centre. And in 2001, an 18 year old guy, a chap called uh, Wayne Jowett, he went into that hospital. Uh, unfortunately, he had leukemia. He was being treated for leukemia. He was going for chemotherapy. And for that, his treatment, he there were two drugs that was in, uh, to be administered. One had to be injected into the bloodstream, and one had to be uh, injected into his nervous into the nervous system through spinal cord. Mm-hmm. And the doctor on duty that day, uh, he messed it up. He put the wrong drug in the wrong place, and uh, and Mr. Jowett uh, fell into a coma and he died from within a month. Real tragedy. And obviously there was uproar and the doctor, he was uh, tried for manslaughter and was struck off. And so that's managing the people, right? Hold people accountable, make them accountable for their performance. Now, Mr. Wenjiao was undeniably let down hideously by the National Health Service, but the doctor made a mistake. Everybody makes mistakes. When they went, did the when they did the accident investigation, um, they found out that there was a host of failures that caused the problem. I repeat myself with the Swiss cheese story, but things like. The drugs should not have been administered on the same day. Mm-hmm. They were. The drugs should not have been sent to the wards on the same day because they're not sent to the ward on the same day. They can't be. Mm-hmm. They were. Um, the drugs should have been sent in different, uh, very different packaging. They weren't. Uh, the doctor, the guy who made the mistake, it was his second day on the job and he hadn't been trained. He should have been, right? So my point being that there was this whole host of failures that caused uh, that unfortunate incident, the doctor made a mistake. It was just one of those. The performance is in the system. It is not in the people. Don't worry about managing people. We spend months every, well, not months, we spend weeks, certainly weeks in big organisations managing people, but the performance is in the system. Um, That same incident, that very same incident, has happened on 13 different occasions in the previous 15 years, right? Disciplining the doctors doesn't solve the problem. What's really interesting, or you know, is the solution. So the um, the guy who investigated this was a chap called Brian Toth, and he came up with a solution a bit like you can't put I've forgotten this the right way. You can't put diesel into a petrol car because the nozzle's too big for the hole for the, for the petrol can hole. Yeah. Mm-hmm. His suggestion, uh, his suggestion was well, you just change the size of the needles and the syringes so that you can only inject. Stuffing the spinal column into a spinal needle, which is you a know, very simple fail safe solution. It took 13 years for the NHS to roll out. Yeah, now they're there now. But my point, yeah, fix the system, don't fix the people. If you really want to excel, fix the system. And it, you know, I'm repeating myself now, Adrian, right? I go round and round and round. I am, um, when I was uh, 21, I have got a degree. I've got a degree in genetics. I was a scientist. My dad, bless him, had a degree in history. And I thought, that's a waste of time. You know, I'm a scientist. Why would you be a historian? Right? And he looked at me. And, the, you know, that sort of withering look you must have got from your own dad on occasion. And he looked at me and he said, because people behave the way people behave. Right? So when I say man is by morons, you go through this same cycle over and over again. Fix the system, not the people. There you go. Here ends of that particular lesson. <laughs> Brilliant. I love it. Um, so a few quick fire questions before we finish up. So we talked about a whole bunch of stuff. But I always ask people to boil things down and to basically ask them to complete this sentence. Yeah. And the sentence, the sentence is, if you want to improve your customer or employee experience, James Lawler says, do this. Da, da, da. What would be your answer? That's up. What? You know, S up. Uh, American, Fair. I think. Yeah. Two uh-huh. S admits you have got a problem. 
If you don't admit you've got a problem, you can't fix it. There's a lovely quote, another quote for you uh, in Japanese. I think it was someone, a big in Toyota, Taichi, anyway, and he said, no problem is the biggest problem of all. Yeah. So fess up. I mean, you've got oh, a problem. Yeah, fantastic. Um, yes, Taichi Ono was, was Toyota, um, if I recall correctly. Um, no, for a punk question, how could we not, given this is a punk CX podcast, um, what company or brand do you think takes more of a punk approach to customer experience or you think is an experienced leader and why? Yeah. So I'm totally going to not answer this question. I'm going to twist it on its head, right? So most, uh, you get the whole sort of good to great experience here or in search of excellence, those books which were massive in the 80s and 90s. Yeah. These companies that did a really good job and what you should emulate them. But then later on, it was just survivorship bias, they had problems. Mm -hmm. So let's talk instead about a company that really screwed things up. Yeah, because you learn from failure, right? We were talking about this the other day, Adrian, but if you really want to learn, there is a book by Mick Wallace uh, called The Great Post Office Scandal, which is about failures in the post office. Yeah, this should be compulsory reading in every MBA across the world on how not to manage, yeah? So the positive side of this was, you know, they did this great big transformation project. They invested in a new system. They um, Then they managed to turn the post office profitable by um, squeezing the economies out after they put in this new system. I believe the chief executive, she actually got, was it CBE she got because of her, the success she did, something like that? And the reality is that they convicted, what, 900 people incorrectly for fraud, false accounting or theft. And it's the biggest fun, uh, biggest legal scandal this country has seen, right? Why? Because they were focusing on the wrong thing. They thought their system was working and it wasn't. Because it wasn't working, they uh, got the wrong information and then therefore people were yeah, committing crimes, which they weren't. No attempt to improve and just a culture of denial. And it's going to cost, it's going to cost you and me, Adrian, a billion quid to, um, to fix it up. Yeah. So, you know, haste to the in how not to do things. Yeah. Perfect. Um, so the final question before we wrap up now, um, I've been doing this for a little while now and it's trying to end the podcast on a bit of a good news story uh, because the world's a weird place. There's a lot of kind of like stuff going on and I find myself almost doom scrolling every morning with my first cup of coffee. And so I've been asking people to share with me what is the most, like a good news story. So that, what is the most interesting, positive, or exciting thing that you've seen in the last week? Well, not sure if it was positive, but certainly very funny. So cool. Cool uh, it was an article which I read and it was on the BBC. So we have this thing that we will talk about customer experience and the customer always being right. Well, customer isn't always right, so I'll read really this for you. So apparently, one set in, what's well, uh, one September night last year, two dog walkers peered through a window into a dark cafe to see bodies lying on the ground, covered with blankets and surrounded by candles, and a mysterious person in a robe walking between them. Convinced they had stumbled on some sort of ritual mass murder, the dog workers uh, called the police, and officers rushed to the cafe in St. Leonard's, which you don't know it is on the Lincolnshire coast near Skegness. You can imagine, you know, dark, misty night, <laughs> and then what they found was a yoga class in session. Yeah. And then apparently the <laughs> yoga instructor said, well, I guess from the outside view, it could look like that, a mass murder, because they're all really still very nice and relaxed. So there you go. This article, you really should read it. It's got about six or seven examples of where you know people really didn't think about what they were doing. There is a priceless story about a dismembered toe and a picture of this dismembered toe. You have to see it. And the, oh, article, the article is called Harry Potter Wands. Six other times people were fooled by false alarms. It's on the BBC. You should have a look. Very funny. Well, something to make us smile. Uh, I will make sure I try and look that up and, and put a link in the uh, in the highlights. But James, uh, first of all, I just want to say always nice to see you. Thank you for congratulations on the book. I know it's, it's been very kind of well received. Uh, I've seen some of the reviews of it because I think it's just people kind of it resonates with kind of people, but I just want to say also, thank you for sharing your time and your insight and your expertise and your perspective with us today. That's been brilliant. 
Well, thank you very much for having me. I hope you bang on too much. <laughs> Not at all. Wow, what a great interview. I hope you enjoyed it. I know I did. Find out more about me and the work that I do at adriansrinsco.com. Do leave a review on your favorite podcast platform. And if you have any comments, feedback, or questions about the podcast, then feel free to send me a message to podcast at adrianswinsco.com. And do tune in again. Thanks very much.